If any of you have been a bit disappointed today that you've not seen the weakness mechanic at full display, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, this is the game for you. And I've actually put a lot of thought in this into myself because I like Golisopod Garboda. But we'll talk about that more later because we are starting Nico with a Tapu Lele start and Paolo with a Trubbish. Straight away, Nico is going to put the stadium into play, the Scorched Earth, and he's going to discard uh, one fire energy. It looks like we're just going to sort out, make sure the GX marker is in play because that could be <laughs> an important factor in the game. And uh, he is going to kick off here by drawing two cards by discarding a fire energy uh, via his stadium. And uh, didn't really get to see what he's got, but most likely he's got a pretty decent turn. The Volca Ooh, looks like it's an attachment to the Tapu Lele, but we have to bear in mind that fire archetypes a are able to get so many energy into play no matter what that it's not really too detrimental here. No, I mean, with things like Blacksmith and Volcanian's Power Heater, and he has got a couple energy in the discard, which you do need. It looks like he had to get rid of a whole bunch of supporters there, but then again, it's expanded. We've got Versus Seeker to get them back, so that's not even, you know, a, a particularly worrying revelation here. So, Ooh. no, I think he's doing all right. Something a bit more worrying is that he's found no fire type Pokemon just yet and Paolo straight away he's going to be able to use that heavy ball for the Seismitoad X this is another big equalizer that he's going to require this game to make life a lot more awkward for Nico to set up his strategy one great card that is played alongside the Glissopod is of course Seismitoad X so this is a big factor here he has the double colorless energy in hand he also has an ultra ball this turn he may be looking for something like uh, Tapu Lele here in order to get himself a more powerful supporter to find himself a Floatstone to move out of the active and start initiating that Quaking Punch. And if your opponent's got a very bad setup and you can block their item cards while doing a bunch of damage. Now, Ho-Oh isn't weak to water, but all the other attackers, the Turtonator, the Volcanian, are weak to water. So we've actually got the same level of weakness being hit by Paolo as we have being hit by Nico. Now, here's an interesting play. He's actually got himself a Tapu Coco here. Now, he does have an N in the discard, a Versus Seeker in hand, so he's still got a supporter to play. He might be trying to go for a Tapu Coco here, but I think, I mean, it, this cannot be a matchup Paolo wants to face. Mm. So you've got, yeah, I was going to say, you've got to think he's going to be going Quaking Punch here. Yeah, indeed. It's interesting that even though Nico basically drew seven cards from Sycamore and then simply passed, Paolo still went for an N. Oftentimes when you see your opponent really not do much, uh, you try and use a different supporter from N. But Paolo wanted to get the Tapu Coco developed as quickly as possible because now he has coverage over both Ho-Oh and the uh, Pokemon like Volcanian and Turtonator. So he has type coverage on his own side here. You can see that he's adapted his strategy immediately. He's seen Fire Energy, okay. Galissapod is not my win condition here. <laughs> I need to use everything but Galissapod. So he's going to start developing all sorts of different Pokemon to try and make life as awkward as possible. And he found himself a Floatstone. That's a big hit for him. That is absolutely huge. Now we'd expect him to be playing a bunch of Floatstone. He is playing three of them. But the Quaking Punch here, because again, we didn't get a huge look, but it looked like Nico had to discard a whole bunch of supporters on turn one, which makes him more reliant on item cards like Versus Seeker. So Quaking Punch here could actually be what's needed to essentially lock Nico out of the game. We do see two, a ho -Oh and a Turtonator coming down. And a Kiawe here would be huge. We're going to see him choose to manually attach to the Ho-Oh. He actually had the option of maybe attaching to the Tapu Lele and starting to put pressure on the Seismitoad. But bear in mind that Paolo does have access to plenty of scoop-up style effects because it is, of course, a, a Glissopod variant. So instead, Nico's going to say, you know what, I'm going to try and draw cards via my Shaman, via my Stadium, the Scorched Earth, and try and develop this Ho-Oh as quickly as possible so I can get one-hit KOs no matter what. I think that's a good shout because... Ho-Oh really is the play here. I'm just thinking, looking at Paolo's side of the board, though, if he hits a Garboda, the Garbotoxin Garboda, then he's actually locking Nico out of abilities and items. Now, that's not yeah. a new thing. Seismitoad Garboda's been doing this for quite some time. <laughs> but, of course, th this is a primarily Golisopod deck. You're playing a 4-3 line. That is your main attacker. There's one Seismitoad, two Tapu Coco. So... It, you know, one of the, well, sorry, two of the attacking Garboda here. So he could actually be doing quite well here. Yeah, it's a really nice one-off 
tech card that does try to balance the matchup as much as possible. And Paolo identified it very quickly and is getting uh, big benefits out of it really early on. He's going to continue to develop his side of the field with the Ultra Ball here. He might indeed be going for the Garbatoxin if he is able to. We do know that one is in his prize cards, so it looks like he won't have the option to do it because, again, he's opting to play a 2-1 line of the Garbador, which is a bit of a shame for him. Um, so he's going to continue to look at his hand and see what else he wants to develop. Maybe it's his other Tapu Koko. Maybe it is time to get, in, uh, get some Wimpods down on the board. Um, nevertheless, it wasn't the most painful Ultra Ball, so maybe he was just doing this to thin his own hand size regardless. Quite possibly, and I think you've hit it with a Wimpod there, Joe. That is quite upsetting. There's two games in a row where we've seen players playing the 2-1 Garboda split mm -hmm. with only one of the ability lock and being punished for doing so. One thing I also love about the Tapu Koko that we haven't mentioned yet, you said about Ace Roller and these things you can do to pick up Pokemon. Ace Roller, Tapu Koko and Seismitoad go together so beautifully. Because if your opponent doesn't KO Seismitoad, you Ace Roller to pick it up, put Koko active, Bench Seismitoad, attach double colorless, retreat Coco, and we are off. As Paolo plays a Professor Sycamore to get a new hand of seven cards. Pretty nice there. He's going to, pretty much now that he's seen that his Garbatoxin is uh, in the prize cards, he's just going to go ahead and grab himself the Trash Launch Garbador. He finds himself another double colorless energy, which he can commit to this Tapu Coco. So later down the line, maybe a combination of Tapu Coco and Tapu Lele can start dealing with the Ho-Oh that Nico's looking for, but for now he's content to continue to go for these little pokes of Quaking Punch. Obviously, damage-wise it's not incredible, but it really is slowing down Nico here. And that's what he's got to do. Ooh, oh, I do like Blacksmith. Here we Black go. Two cards, two fire energy from the discard to one of your fire Pokemon. Blacksmith is one of the cards I most miss from the standard format. I really, really like Blacksmith. And here, of course, ho -Oh will just deal a flat 180. <laughs> Can't use it the following turn, but a flat 180 to KO Seismitoad, and that is bad news right now. That's a really big two prizes that Nico took, finding the Blacksmith. Typically, they play three or four copies, so he has mul uh, many avenues to find it, even under um, item lock so he has been able to find that goes for a massive uh, phoenix burn and paolo he's going to promote his free retreating tapu coco that could even be a decent attacker here thanks to hitting for weakness on ho oh especially if he's going to be able to find himself something like choice band off of the end that he's opted to play here trying to limit nico and his outs once again that would be quite good now of course he would be hitting a hundred with flying flip if he could hit the choice band here while doing 20 to the other pokemon on nico's side of the board if he could use two flying flips without getting ko'd that could make a huge difference of course nico now has access to all of his items again Again, with Seismitoad going down. And um, this is not what Paolo wants to see. Paolo needs to have a combination of Garboda, Tapu Lele, and Seismitoad. Oh, he gets the choice ban. That's huge. That's a really nice pickup for him because, as we've just stated, the effect of um, Hoto's attack means it can't use Phoenix Burn the following turn. So uh, Tapu Coco definitely going to be threatening this Hoto, forcing Nico to find things like Guzma or maybe his own switching cards, and may have to look to find other attackers here. So the Tapu Coco getting some nice spread damage in, whilst getting predominantly the most important factor here, 100 damage on the active ho -Oh GX. And there is a route to victory here. Golisopod is not off limits here. You can get a one-hit KO on a Seismitoad with first impression, oh, excuse me, a Shaman, with first impression for 120 damage. That Tapu Lele on the bench is very much in first impression range. But it needs to be early game, Tapu Coco, Seismitoad, Garboda, and then just Golisopod when you can afford to do so. Seeing your opponent just take out the Seismitoad without even abusing weakness, which is really what Nico wants to do in this matchup. It puts Paolo so far on the back foot that it's going to be so difficult for him to recover here. And it looks like he's opting to use Turtonator's GX attack, the Nitro Tank. He started off his turn with a Scorched Earth, uh, saw that there's pretty much nothing else he can do. He can't move his Ho-Oh and get it back into the active for a knockout. So instead, he's just going to try and develop energy all over the board. And uh, that is exactly why Turtonator GX is in the deck. He's not only a fantastic attacker in terms of damage output, the Nitro Tank is a great way to reload your energies. It is so good. I think he's debating that last energy. Because if he puts it on the Ho-Oh, that means that with a choice ban, Tapu Lele would hit for, you know, enough damage to get the KO. So, I know he's actually already got it with a choice band. He'd get it without a choice band if he attached it. So, 
He ends up putting it on the Turtonator, of course. Bright Flame discards two energy, so you put four on there, discard two, and then the next turn, you just have to attach one to Bright Flame a second time. Yeah, he feels safe enough. There's not too many item cards in his discard pile, so he thinks he's got plenty of mileage out of this Turtonator for the next few turns. We see Paolo, he's going to be targeting down the um, ho -Oh GX once again. He's going to use that Guzma, retreating, or sorry, promoting his Floatstone Garbodor just to retreat it back again, and simply his turn will end with that knockout with the Flying Flip, and again, putting more damage counters on your opponent's side of the board, thanks to the secondary effect of getting spread damage around here. And I love the spread damage here, because the numbers work perfectly. Now a Golisopod with first impression, we're doing 150. That will KO Turtonator, Volcanion. He, he's really set himself up very, very nicely here. Not only that, but a flying flip from Tapu Koko will now KO a Shaman if he brings it into the active. So now he's forcing Nico to deal with the Tapu Koko as well, because it's now a legitimate threat to take <laughs> four prizes. Yeah, it's really cool. Paolo is going for as many non exes as possible to really make it difficult for Nico to keep up in the race. He does have his Wimpod, he has the Garbador, he has plenty of attacking options which are outside of the Glissopod, so it's really cool to see how he's built his list. We are going to see once again Nico going to benefit from the Floatstone. We saw one Scorched Earth followed by a Steam Up here, and um, he is going to free retreat from the Guzma back into his Turtonator GX, and uh, he is going to opt for the um, Bright Flame for the knockout on the two prize Tapu Lele. And here, I think we need an N. That was a really awkward position, because it depends how many items. If he could get a KO with Garboda while playing an N, that would be absolutely wonderful. Golisopod here with a choice band will get a KO. He's got the Golisopod, but not the choice band. But the thing is, that leaves Nico with a win condition, where a single energy in his Volcanion would then get a KO because of the whole weakness malarkey. So, Paolo, he's played this so well. And he really has done everything he needs to do, but it's just nothing he can do at yeah, this stage. It's just such a um, polarizing matchup, really, especially because Nico hasn't had many discards of annoying uh, item cards. So right now, you can see Paolo, he's going to attach a uh, rainbow energy so that he can get damage on his Garbodor in order to acerola it back up, which is a pretty interesting spot. And uh, he is probably just going to end on a flying flip here. Yeah. Well, he did grab the Garboda out of his prizes mm -hmm. with that previous KO. Yeah. So now he's got the option, and he really is. He's taking a turn and a supporter and an energy attachment to switch Garbodas, <laughs> which is a lot of effort. Yeah, it's a big commitment to try and go for a long game approach. And Nico's only at two prize cards, so I don't know how much longer this game is going to continue. But he's doing everything he can right now. Maybe he's hoping that he can maybe get a Tapu Lele that can survive a hit once he does develop Garbodor. Maybe that's his play here. Um, trying to um, allow all of this prior damage from the Tapu Koko's flying flips to add up and maybe help the Tapu Lele get in range here. One thing that's important, there is no energy on that Volcanion now. So, again, it's quite a bit to ask for, but if Nico could go Golisopod, and actually he no longer needs the Choice Band because of that flying flip. Here so actually here, with an N... Oh, has he not got the N? No, he doesn't have N, so he is just going to concede the first game, and uh, we are going to move on to game two. As we've said, Nico does have type advantage and his own deck, thanks to Blacksmith, and doesn't play a huge amount of item cards, really. No. It's just a bunch of energy. It uses its stadium to draw cards, and uh, it doesn't really need much to set up. So he is in the ascendancy in terms of the matchup. Paolo did exactly what he had to do to try and stay in the game. It's just Nico happened to have Guzma on the right turns, especially the Tapu Lele. That was a huge turn for him. Oh, yes. Um, so both players doing everything they could and it just turns out when both decks are drawing relatively optimally that Nico should come out on top the majority of times. And that's what's got to be quite upsetting for Paolo. His deck ran very well that game. Mm -hmm. It did what it was supposed to do. He had the Seismato turn one just, I mean he wouldn't, I don't think there's a better starter in that situation. No. You could maybe argue Tapu Coco and he didn't really use the Goliath one. He did everything. The one thing though he didn't have the Garbotoxin Garboda. Mm -hmm. He wasn't able to block abilities. Maybe if he does exactly what he just did, with the added advantage of getting rid of abilities starting from turn two, maybe there's a chance. Yeah, that's definitely going to be what he goes for, because as we saw, maybe his way of getting into the game is with some Tapu Koko spreading, getting a knockout on the Ho-Oh thanks to weakness, and then 
if he does develop Garbatoxin, maybe Tapu Lele can then tank hits on his side and start dishing out multiple prizes for him. So that's going to be his route for victory. Nico pretty much just has to do what he just did last game. <laughs> yeah, to be, yeah. I, I can't really put it any better than that, to be honest with you. He has a deck which is clearly favoured in this matchup. Last game, even with a little bit of adversity thrown his way, he did what he needed to do and he won. So, yeah, I mean, when it comes to Nico here, he, he knows what he needs to do. And essentially here, all the onus is being put on Paolo to stop Nico doing what Nico wants to do. Um, slightly messy prizes there, if I might say so. <laughs> He's working on it. He's got the uh, Kiawe. Uh, in the prize cards and a blacksmith but he plays a full complement of four blacksmiths so it's not too awkward for him and uh, Paolo as well has a handful of couple of awkward things always having energy is actually quite awkward for Glisspod Garbador uh, because they play specific like rainbows and uh, blend energies um, but nothing too painful as Paolo is going to kick off here he started off with the Tapu Lele GX and uh, we are going to see he uh, goes for the Professor Sycamore which was kind of ugly but he basically just showed to Nico, look, what else can I do? I have to <laughs> signal this hand. I've got nothing going on. So yeah. uh, he is going to continue to develop as quickly as possible. He goes for that heavy ball once again. And we both have to imagine that there's going to be exactly the yeah. Seismitoad EX. I am stunned, to be perfectly <laughs> honest, Joe. Why would he go for Seismitoad? And actually here, Seismitoad's really nice because it then gives you type advantage over Volcanion. Although Volcanion's 130 HP means it won't be KO'd with two quaking punches. Oh, but he does get the very shiny double colorless energy and he gets the choice band as well. No Wimpod down, but he doesn't need Wimpod. Mm. What he really wants is a turn two quaking punch plus ability lock. And that turn one, he's got a lot. But then he'll still need double floatstone, essentially, or an energy floatstone and a Garboda to pull it off. Yeah, exactly. So we do see Nico, just like the Darkrai variants, the Fire variants also love putting energy in their discard pile because of the blacksmiths that we've already mentioned, um, and because there's power heater as an option. And Nico has started with the non EX Volcanian to maybe get some energy on the field that way. They love playing from the discard pile, and that is one of the factors that we see possible because of cards such as Battle Compressor. Um, you can just play from the discard pile so much more freely and so much more consistently. So we see a really nice Ultra Ball from him, followed up by a Shaman EX to draw a bunch more cards here. Yeah, and his deck's just running so smoothly. One of the things we see in the expanded format, far more than the standard format, is once you bring in all of these tricks versus Seeker and Shaman and these A-Spec Trainer cards, all Kiawe Turn 1, <laughs> got to be onto the ho -Oh. Yeah. You have these options in Expanded, and you find, and this is no coincidence, Expanded decks gen tend to run much more smoothly. In Standard, we see a fair few games where it's just, I have nothing I can do with this hand. You have a go. <laughs> you see that in Expanded, but it's so much rarer. It's generally just, I'm going to play these 20 cards. Look at my amazing setup. Only to pass to your opponent who goes, well, I'm going to play these 20 cards. Look at my amazing setup. <laughs> Yeah, it's a completely different game, really, because we have access to such a large card pool that everyone can do so much more during their turn, so much more consistently as well. So uh, we do see Paolo opting to go for the safer route and, again, going to do a, uh, Professor Sycamore here, getting rid of, of his entire hand. Uh, it's safest, of course, to attach the double colorless energy. He would still pretty much like to find a float stone to preserve it on the Tapu Lele because it does become one of his most important attackers later on in the game. Uh, but for now, he may just have to be content retreating and going for Quaking Punch. Um, but that's a really threatening Ho-Oh GX on the bench from Nico right now. Yeah, and that's a real big issue here. Because, say, a Blacksmith would give Volcanian enough energy to manually retreat, and then Ho-Oh would get the KO. So this is very, very awkward. He did get the Ultra Ball, which is good, but he didn't get the tool. And the thing is, Nico's starting to get set up now. Really, against it, because he doesn't need Steam Up in this matchup. Mm -hmm. Steam Up might be useful to get a KO on a Seismitoad with Volcanion, but it, it's very rarely useful. So it really is, it, it needs to be early game, getting rid of abilities to stop your opponent being able to set up. But Nico's already got a decent setup going here. And you were right, Joe. He's not going for the Seismitoad because he's kind of worried about the Ho-Oh. Yeah, worried about the Ho-Oh. I think 
one of the things he didn't want to happen really was if he pays retreat on the Tapu Lele and then the side yeah. of the toad does get knocked out, he's pretty much out of all options. It does, however, mean that this uh, Guzma is going to be very painful and very strong from Nico here because he's going to be taking a big knockout, getting rid of a choice banded size of a toad EX and not really having to worry about item lock unless Paolo is able to find himself something like a rescue stretcher, uh, which he's already discarded one of with one of his painful Professor Sycamores that he so vastly just like threw down onto the board. He wasn't too pleased about it, but there we go. Boom, big 180 uh, damage knockout, enough to take two prize cards and Nico is in the ascendancy here. Oh, yes. I didn't want to interrupt you there, Joe, because you're making excellent points. But the second that Tapu Lele went down, I was like, Guzma. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and, I mean, it, it, not that it was some, like, massive find on my part. It was absolutely the play to be done. And getting rid of that Seismitoad resources, it, it's just harsh. And now Paolo's in the situation where what does he do? All right, he plays the Ultra Ball. Good. And then he can maybe go and, you know, maybe find himself a, a tool. But he really needs to get rid of that ho -Oh. And even, and this is what's super annoying about ho -Oh. If ho -Oh had 180 HP, then Golisopod's GX attack with a choice band does 180. But it doesn't, it has 190. <laughs> so it's not even like you can get a KO once per game. So oh, he's not even hit any tools. He was looking to find himself a choice band for the active and a float stone for the bench, but he's got nothing. It's going to be a very weak flying flip here, and he's not too pleased about it. You can see on his face that it's just not the optimal draws for him right now, and uh, he's just going to have to end his turn content with a 40 damage flying flip instead of 100 damage, and that is a huge difference here. Oh, yes, and we saw last game... It's got to go right for Paolo. Paolo mm. has got to do everything he can and do it well just to have a chance in a game that is this, frankly, unfavourable for him. And as it stands at the moment, he, he just doesn't have it. He doesn't have anything he can really do here. And when you're in such an unfavourable matchup and you're like turn three flying flip... <laughs> That is not where you want to be. Yeah, it's not a really game-winning attack, which is what he's going to need to do here if he's going to flip this game around. Nico does kick off with the uh, Scorched Earth that he put into play, just really protecting himself from ends later down the line. He's also going to play an Ultra Ball. Looks like he doesn't really want any targets from that. Again, just trying to thin cards, it looks like. Um, if he's able to find maybe like a Blacksmith play, he could just freely retreat with a Floatstone that he attached. Uh, looks like he's going to go for Professor Sycamore here. Um, so it may just be a slower power heater turn uh, from Nico this turn. So hopefully, on Paolo's side at least, he might have a turn of pressure off, really. Indeed. Now, the choice band on, Co on Tapu Coco, or should I say the lack of choice band on Tapu Coco, that's really big because we saw the double flying flip last game. And I know it didn't work out and it didn't win him the game. But double flying flip could mean you KO ho -O, while putting everything else into first impression range, slash bringing it down to a much more manageable HP for Garboda to take out with Trash Alanche. So we he hasn't do got see, that. Yeah, we do see the power heater here, and Paolo has the option of going for maybe a Guzma of his own and dealing with the ho oh because he already has that double colorless energy on the Tapu Lele. Um, if he's able to get that floatstone, which he missed last turn, um, that could be a really powerful play. You see him looking through his discard pile, eyeing up the Versus Seeker, seeing what his best option is, because he can deal with the Ho-Ho this turn if he has access to Guzma, but instead he's going to go for the end here and uh, hopefully re-establish ability lock. I think that's definitely his priority this turn. Oh yes, he would have needed a choice band or a double colourless along with that. He's currently hitting 120, putting Ho-Ho up oh, to yeah. 160. So he needed either double colourless or choice band. If he'd had either of those, I agree with you entirely. I think playing the Guzma would have been absolutely the play because everything else is kind of manageable mm. but hitting 180 so that it can one hit KO Seismitoad and Tapu Lele that's what really hurts and you know these fire decks have a real advantage over Golisopod, but with your non-Golisopod Pokemon and Ace Roller you can make a game of it until Ho-Oh comes out. <laughs> there it is. We find him developing the Floatstone. And as you said, the Ho-Oh just hits way too much damage. <laughs> it's a really crazy attack. It's just me. Normally, normally when we see Pokemon with four energy attack costs, you pretty much write them off because they're just too expensive. But in Fire Archetypes, where you just have access to Kiawe and Blacksmith and Power Heater, it's so reasonable. It's actually like a really efficient cost, as strange as it is. So, Paolo, he does develop the uh, Floatstone. He also got a a uh, rainbow energy to his trash launch, but it looks like he looked at Nico's discard pile. There's not enough in there, so he's just going to 
be content with a flying flip. And maybe Nico draws no energy, no blacksmith, no versus seeker, <laughs> and no floatstone. Yeah, maybe. And that Volcania stays in the active. And if Paolo can get a few more flying flips, we're in business. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Ever the optimist, Ross. I love it. <laughs> That's all he needs. We see Nico going for that Scorched Earth. Every um, Turtonator build we've seen so far has been so reliant on the uh, Scorched Earth. It is such a big card in this, arch in this, uh, yeah, this archetype because you have... Um, 16 fire energy in lists and actually Nico's playing 17 in fact which is just an absurd number of energy in any other archetype you'd think it's just not the right decision but um, in fire decks it just works so cleanly and we see Nico goes for the blacksmith gets uh, more energy onto the active Volcanian so he can simply go for the steam artillery to finally deal with his Tapu Koko which is just I mean Everything Paolo tries. Everything he tries. <laughs> and you're right. I mean, these fire decks at the moment, it's not just that they can use Kiawe to attach from the deck and that they've got Blacksmith to attach from the discard and that they've got Power Heater to attach from the discard. It's that when you combine that with Scorched Earth and Steam Up, making it incredibly easy to get the energy into the discard, you just run so, so smoothly. I mean, this would have been, I know Nick said this on the stream earlier, but I'm sorry, I've got to copy Nick here. This would have been my pick for the tournament. This was the deck I was testing most in advance of this tournament. And... The only deck I think that really has an advantage over these fire decks is Greninja, being a single prize water deck. Even a deck like Lapras, you're just trading two hit KOs and you've got all of these tricks so you don't really care. It's such a powerful deck. And then you put it against something like Golisopod, where you get extra advantages of weakness. And, you know, and I need to stress here, Paolo is playing this game very well. He's a player at 3-0. and He's just run into a wall, essentially. Yeah, it's a very, very awkward deck to face, specifically for his list. But as you said, Volcanian on these sort of uh, Turtonator builds, they don't have anything that they're really overly scared of so uh, it is a very smart play for the tournament and we saw it do very well in Fort Wayne as well so we've seen optimal lists from very good <laughs> players in the US and uh, many Europeans have adapted those and gone for very similar strategies there because it's just very easy to look at a successful list and say you know what yeah this did well I can see myself playing this and doing well <laughs> as well so um, we're seeing that come into effect here Paolo is going to take his first prize of the game on the Noni X Volcanian using his Garbodor. And Nico, it's over to him now. He has promoted his uh, Ho-Oh, which could easily take another prize this turn uh, just with the energy already on it. And it really depends on what else Nico wants to do during his turn because, once again, he's in a good spot. And once again, it's almost, almost like trademark. He has always started pretty much every turn by just going for the Scorched Earth and just seeing more cards, getting the most out of his hand. And I really like this from Nico. And I really like this from Nico. He is actually going here for a blacksmith onto Volcanian. Mm -hmm. This is what we were saying about in the previous round with Philip Schultz. Now he's got two attackers. So what he does here, and this is absolutely the right play, he pops up Volcanium. Now he gets a KO. He's got two prize cards remaining, a floatstone on the active Volcanium that he can use to retreat next turn, and enough energy to manually the retreat, even if the floatstone goes away. And then he's got 180 damage potentially coming out from the ho -O. So whereas the Volcanium can KO the Glycopod, the ho -Oh can KO the Tapu Lele or the Golisopod. And at this stage, and stop me if you've heard this before, Joe, Nico just needs a Guzma to win the game. Yeah, that's always the case in the Pokemon GCG. <laughs> um, Guzma is oftentimes the final card played in games because people naturally try and make it so that you can't win the game. They will try and skew the prize race. But um, Guzma oftentimes is the way to finding that victory a turn earlier than otherwise. So we look at Paolo's hand here. He has the ability lock developed. Uh, so maybe, again, it, it's down to a Guzman play if he can get it. But I'm not sure if he has the energy required in order to deal with this um, Ho-Oh here. We do see him go for the Guzma. Is it going to be a stalling Guzma? Or is it going to be trying to target down um, one of his attackers here? You can see Nico preemptively thinking, well, it's probably going to be the Ho-Oh because he has to deal with that at some point. He has with the Tapu Lele. The Tapu Lele would currently be hitting with the 6 energy 120 plus a choice band 150 with the 60 on Ho-Oh puts him up to 210. Mm -hmm. So this is about the only thing Paolo can do. Yeah. He takes out the Ho-Oh and now we've just got 
the Volcanian. Now, Volcanian can get the KO on Golisopod. Oh, uh, there it is. <laughs> like, for instance, using a Versus Seeker for a Guzma. There we go. And uh, we can see it was just so simple for Nico and Paolo. Not too pleased with himself, but it is just one of those bad matchups that you do run into. We know the uh, Glissopod Garbodor deck is very powerful, but it often relies on the, the amount of HP that Glissopod has in order to take hits and then 